Morning, everybody. I came this close to saying happy Sabbath. <laughs> and the reason I follow, always follow good morning with happy Sabbath is that good morning is something that I've, I don't use normally. I never say good morning. I didn't grow up saying good morning to anybody, but I had to learn good morning when I became a pastor because that's pastor language that we're required to learn. And to me, whenever I see anybody in the morning and say good morning, it's always on Sabbath, so... Almost, happy Sabbath almost comes right out of my mouth. So, Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for bringing us together again today. We ask for two things. We ask for soft hearts and open minds that we become pliable children that you can continue to mold us in your image and uh, that we could become pitchers that uh, not hold on to your grace but pour it out. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I started with a quote from Abraham Heschel. I want to read it again <clears throat> because where we're going to go today, I think it's uh, uh, more than appropriate. He said that it's customary to blame secular science and anti-religious philosophy for the eclipse of religion in modern society. It would be more honest to blame religion for its own defeats. Religion declined not because it was refuted, but because it became irrelevant, dull, oppressive, and insipid. When faith is completely replaced by creed, worship by discipline, love by habit, when the crisis of today is ignored because of the splendor of the past, when faith becomes an heirloom rather than a living fountain, when religion speaks only in the name of authority rather than with the voice of compassion, its message becomes meaningless. We come to the darkest shadow, I believe, that that Israel and that, that anybody, any of the children of Abraham have lived in for the past, oh, I don't know, six centuries now, five centuries, four centuries. We've lived in this shadow ever since there were uh, fallen creatures and a God who's trying to reach them. I keep bringing us back to Sinai. What did it mean to walk in the light? What did he have in mind for us? What did he want to speak to them foremost. We noticed that he spoke to them first the commandments and didn't write them down until after they refused to what? After they refused to come up the mountain. So the first time he writes them down is after they refused to come up. He speaks them first. And he said, you say to the Israelites, you've seen for yourselves that I spoke to you from heaven. I spoke to you face to face. And what was it he spoke, by the way? What was the, what was the first thing that he spoke to them? It was the Ten Commandments, that's right, the Ten Commandments. Now, God kept Moses up there for quite a while, said a lot of things, 11 chapters worth, and when, God, and when Moses comes down, he's carrying something, and what is he carrying? He's carrying those guys, isn't he? I hate that picture, but it was one that I could use for free, Okay. When God finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him two tablets of the covenant, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Now again, my main point, he doesn't write them down until after they refuse the face-to-face -face relationship. He doesn't write them down until after they refuse to come up the mountain. So you could argue, you could say, because in the movie, Charlton Heston even holds up the tablets and says, behold, what? Written with the finger of God, okay, and you're saying, okay, written with his very finger, all right, and so I wore my, uh, the closest thing I have to sandals, I wore my flip-flops today, and I'm going to take them off because I know I'm about to tread on some very holy ground. Amen. I'm here to tell you that I believe that the word written down is all part of plan B, it's part of the shadow. And the very scriptures that are written down call it a shadow. I told you this before, that the book of Hebrews calls two things a shadow, okay? Uh, a shadow, living in the shadow, something that isn't what it was supposed to be, okay? Just an indication. It says, first of all, it's the sanctuary. It's a sketch, a shadow of the what? 
the heavenly one, a shadow, okay? And then he says, since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered year after year, make perfect those who approach. The written word is a shadow. It can't perfect And in the same way, it can't do anything for us than the sanctuary can because they're what? They're shadows. So I know there's been a traditional argument, so let's let's put this one out there. I know there's been a traditional argument, and I note that word again, argument, about when we talk about the law, that there somehow is a difference between ceremonial laws and these guys. Okay, that there, that there somehow is a difference there. And, and, and I want to be clear, okay, that the law is the shadow that is the shadow includes everything written, including those. How do I know? John says so, John 1.17. He says, the law indeed was given through what? Through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It's a very important verse right there. He's saying there's a difference between the written transmission of the law that was given through who? Moses. Why is Moses the one giving the law in the first place? They asked him to. This is who they asked for. You have Moses go speak to him. Because if we do, we will surely what? We will surely die. They're too afraid. Too afraid to come up the mountain. So Moses now becomes the transmitter. And God has to write it down. He gives us the first five books of the Torah. What does he do? He writes them down. So you can feel it, can't you? You can feel it. I can, I can feel the tension already. I sense these things. Okay. But I know I'm on holy ground. I know I'm holy ground. So hold off on your conclusions of what you think I'm saying. All right. Because Jesus said this, didn't he? He said, don't think that I've come to what? Abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to fulfill. I've not come to abolish either. (laughs) But I also, I can't be the one who fulfills. He can. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So I feel the heat, the friction, the urge to debate right now. Ceremonial law. Ten Commandments, are they different? The urge that comes deep within our Adventist DNA, our very soul, just to prove that one of us is right and the other is what? And the other is wrong. So if I can ask you just to follow, follow me for a minute. Can you go with me to find something that I believe has been missed? We've studied the covenant now for a few days. I said that when we got to the new covenant, when we get to tomorrow, that probably you will find it really wasn't new. You'll probably find that it really was the original covenant all along. And I don't want to use the word old, because again, there's a word that is written down, old. It's written on a page. Open your Bibles, and, and you open it up, and one of the very first things is you're introduced to the Old Testament. Okay? It's written down. It's on a page. So it must be true, right? But I think that the old covenant, if you want to call it that, was simply that God wanted to walk and talk with his children. Fallen and unfallen. Remember, the fall did not change God. The new covenant is Jesus Christ. God with what? God with legs. God with legs and God with a mouth. I think that for all the millennia, God was so looking forward to the incarnation because he finally gets to do what he said he always wanted to do, and that is walk and talk with his children. In the beginning was the word. Written down? No. Spoken, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then the word became what? And the word became flesh, sorry. And he lived among us, and we've seen his glory, the glory as a father's only son, full of grace 
and truth. Jesus is the fulfillment of the covenant. The word finally walks and talks with his children. But when he did, what happened? He was in the world and the world came into being through him, yet what? The world did not know him. He came to what was his own and his own people did not accept him. I believe that when John is talking about the world, he says, sure, the world didn't, didn't uh, accept him, even though he created them, right? But his own people, the people that claimed for the past 3,000 years that they've been looking for this Messiah, why? Because they've been studying what? They've been studying the written word, and they've been studying the written word for 3,000 years, and he shows up and walks and talks in their face, and they miss him. They don't even see him. Hence my argument that the written word is a shadow. And if we spend all of our times in the shadows, we don't even recognize the light when he's standing right in front of us. So I believe the biggest shadow is not the sanctuary, and the biggest shadow is not the priesthood. I believe the biggest shadow is the law. And not the law that was spoken face to face to them, the law that was what? The law that was written down. It's back to that decision. It's back to that decision to either live in the shadow or come up the mountain. The new covenant is described in Jeremiah 31. Listen to what is coming, if you will. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. The house of, uh, house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband. What's the difference between the old and the new covenant? It was them. It's still his covenant. It's just not going to be like the one back then. Why? Because they refused it. They refused to live in it. They refused to come up the mountain. They decided that they would stay in the shadows. They would put intercessors between uh, the God who wants to walk and talk with them face to face. And those intercessors was a priesthood, a sanctuary, and the written word. But this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I'll put my law where? Within them. I'll write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Guess what happens when the law is written on the heart? No longer do they teach each other anymore, which is really sad for me because I love teaching. This is what I love doing. This is my passion. But do you realize that when the new covenant comes, there's no need for pastors and teachers anymore? Why? Why? Because God finally has the relationship with each and every person that he always wanted to walk with them and to talk with them. No one will say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. I'll forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. We won't have to be told anymore that God loves us. We won't have to be told anymore that he wants to forgive our sin or that he has forgiven our sin and that there's a way to him, nobody will have to tell us that anymore. By the way, when should that covenant have taken place? You and me. We already should be living there, shouldn't we? How many here have met Jesus Christ? How many here believe he is who he says he is? Then, you see, we already should be here. The new covenant isn't coming. The new covenant has been here since the day that Jesus walked down from the mountain and said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the repent is that they still think that it's coming. He says, change your mind about what's coming. He says, it's not coming, it's here. God taking on flesh, bringing the kingdom to earth. Yes, there's a fulfillment coming, but the kingdom has been here. The covenant's been here. So the shadow is not the law. The law within them. The shadow is the law on paper, on stone, on, on tablets. I've got in here, right, right here, I have 26 Bibles, including Hebrew and Greek, right in here. Okay. 
but it's still a shadow. No matter how bright I make the screen, it's still a shadow. So Jesus comes to a people who want to live in the shadows. He comes to a people who only have the law written on paper and parchment and being taught by rabbis. These are the people that he comes to. The very scriptures that predicted him and have been predicting him since Genesis 3.15, he comes to them and they know him not. Why? Because they're content with still living in the shadows. They're content with still wanting to bring their sacrifices to the temple and wanting to, to relate to God this way. So he comes to them and he says this, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have what? You have eternal life and it's they that testify on my behalf, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Why is it, why is it that a a people of the word, which is what Israel was, why is it that that a group of people as well informed, as uh, uh, completely centered in the word, why is it that they would want to refuse to come to Christ to have life? Why? Because Jesus is here to give it to them. And they already feel they deserve it. Do you ever notice in the opening uh, uh, chapter of Romans where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel? Do you ever wonder about that line? Why would a Pharisee be ashamed of the gospel? Because when Paul went from Saul, the Pharisee, to Paul, he realized that the gospel he'd been working for his entire life was given to him as a gift. And a Pharisee is ashamed of the gospel because they can't hold out an empty hand. We'll talk about this tomorrow when Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Anybody who can hold out an empty hand Not hold up how well I know the scriptures. Not hold up the relationship that I have with this. The problem with this is that I can interpret this any way that I want. And unfortunately, more times than not, my selfish nature, which hasn't been done away with, is going to allow me to interpret these scriptures to take the shadow and begin to use it in a way that God never meant for it to be used. Not his word. So the scriptures, Jesus says. All the law, all the prophets, all the writings, ceremonial, civil, all of it. The Bible, all written down. Stone, paper, electronic. They're all missing something. Every one of them are missing something. So what are they missing? What's the difference? What's the difference between the words that God spoke before he wrote wrote them down? It was the invitation to come up the mountain. It was the invitation to have it written on their heart. Okay? I want you to begin to imagine the difference between the flesh of your heart and the stone on which the word was written. What's the difference between the two? One's living, and the other is what? And the other isn't. Did you know that Paul, who loves the scriptures probably ten times more than anybody in this room, calls the ministry of the tablets the ministry of death? Why? Because it's dead. It's written in stone. And God's people have been using the stone and the shadow and refusing to come to the living word. Refusing to come to who? You keep searching the scriptures. It says, keep, keep at it. Because in them you think you find eternal life. Eternal life doesn't come through Bible study, does it? No. What does eternal life come through? Be- believing in Jesus. It comes from Jesus. Actually, it doesn't come from believing in Jesus. <laughs> it comes from Jesus. All Jesus is asking you to do is to believe that. That it only comes from one place. And he's the only one that has it, and he's the only one that offers it. It goes all the way back to the garden. This life that I'm giving you eternal, he told Adam and Eve, only comes from me. So as long as you walk and talk with me. So let me give you a biblical example of what I'm talking about. Okay, It's a familiar story. 
Matthew chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on when? On the Sabbath. If I asked you right now, probably most of us could recite the Sabbath commandment, right? Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. For six days you shall do all your what? All your work. But on the Sabbath day, you refrain from what? You refrain from work. We all just recited the letter of the law, right? Okay. So he's walking through the grain fields, he and his disciples, when? On the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said, look, your disciples are doing what is not what? What is not lawful on the Sabbath. To avoid defiling the Sabbath, Pharisaical theology said this, said, if the broken commandment is the problem, if breaking the commandment is the problem, then why not? And, and what they likened the breaking the commandment to was falling off a cliff. Okay, you're walking along, you're walking along, here is the demarcation of the commandment right here. All right? And to break the commandment, you walk off the cliff. So the Pharisee said, well, if that's the problem right there, then why not begin to make a fence to where you never even come close to the edge of the cliff? So what the Pharisees decided to do, by the way, it's not a bad idea, is it? No, it's not a bad idea at all. What they decided to do was define what the commandment said by saying, what was work? Now, when Moses wrote the commandment down, what was work for most of Israel? What do they have? They're Bedouins. What are, yeah, they're, they're, they're a big tribe. There's a million of them, but they, are they settled in a land? No. So, so they're wandering. What do they have? They're carrying their food and everything on their backs, right? And, and tending livestock and everything else. So when the commandment was written, he's talking to a almost agrarian people. By the way, when they settle the land, what does most people do for a living when they settle the land? They're mostly farmers. That's right. So what would work be for a farmer? Right. So the Pharisees are just helping them out. So they came up with the 39 activities that they defined as work for Israel. And the disciples were breaking quite a few of them. They were harvesting, they were threshing, and they were preparing. They're plucking the grains off. They don't want to eat the husks, so what do they do? Rub them in their hands, and then they hold it out, and then and the husk, what? Blows away. That's what threshing is. And then they were preparing it in order to eat, okay? The commandment says simply what? Don't work. That's what the commandment says. Don't work. It doesn't take into consideration one thing, and I'm going to get to it. It doesn't take into consideration one thing, those disciples. When the word was written in the tablet, I should just keep putting the tablet slide up. Did it take into consideration that one day those disciples, including Jesus Christ himself, who wrote the words on that tablet, were going to be walking through the field that day? Do those words written in that tablet take those guys into consideration? No, because no. the commandment was written to who? It was written to everybody. It was written to a million Israelites. It was given by Moses, written all to them which God had offered a face-to-face -face individual relationship to every one of them, and they decided that they were not going to relate to him that way. They were going to relate to him as a nation, and they were going to let one man intercede on their behalf. So Jesus has an answer for him. He comes back, and he says this. By the way, this is called midrash. It's an excellent and a horrible way to do theology, depending on who you are. Midrash is, is an argumentative form of theology of using scripture to argue with scripture, okay? The Pharisees just came up with the first bit of scripture. What was it? Sabbath, right? They just kind of quoted the Sabbath commandment back to Jesus. So they just came up with the birth, first bit of scripture. Jesus is about to counter with his bit of scripture. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he and his companions were what? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even put him up there. Okay. Oh, 
I'm sorry. I only have the conclusion up there. Okay, let me read it to you. You're going to have to take my word for it. I'm sorry. Have you not read, this is uh, Matthew 12, chapter 3, uh, verse 3, verse 3, sorry. Oh, I hate when PowerPoint just throws me completely off. And it's not PowerPoint's fault, it's my fault. So. Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence. We just learned of the bread of the presence yesterday. What did the law say? Who was allowed to eat the bread of, of the presence? The priests. Who else? No one. No one else. The priests were to eat that bread. There is, the law allows for nobody else to eat that bread. But Jesus says we're talking about who here? We're talking about David here. Okay? He entered the house of God, ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him or his companions to eat, but only for the priests. I need to shut up. Jesus, I need to let Jesus talk. Right. Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath, yet are what? Yet are guiltless. They're defining work by whatever somebody does for a living, and you shouldn't be doing it from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. He said, well, the priests attend in the temple every Sabbath, and they're what? Are they innocent, or are they breaking the commandment? Did David break the law? Yes, he did. Did the priest break the law? Yes, he did. Are the priests lawbreakers? Hmm? Were you here at the beginning? All scripture. Law is law. The same, the same scripture or chapters that are in the Ten Commandments, that, that the Ten Commandments are in, are in the law that says that the priests are only allowed to eat that. All given by Moses. Every bit of it. And by the way, you have to remember when this argument is taking place, too. The, temp, the temple and everything is still in operation. Right? So let me ask you again. Did David break the law? Did the priest break the law? I say no. Jesus says no. But if you know what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have what? Condemned the what? The guiltless. You would not have condemned the guiltless, he says. See, you and I look back and we say, no, they broke the letter of the law. Didn't they? Because the Pharisees are telling the disciples, Jesus and his disciples, that they are breaking the letter of the law. Let me ask you this. By the letter of the law, the standard of the law, just the letter of the standard of, this, of the Sabbath commandment, are Jesus and the disciples breaking it? Yes. yes. They're working on the Sabbath. But Jesus said, if you'd have known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. And then he says something beyond that. He, he says, I don't have it up there again. I tell you, though, something greater than the temple is here. Something greater than the temple. And remember, what is the temple? It's the shadow, though. Right? It is a presence of God, but it's not the presence of God that God wanted with his people. It's the one that the people were comfortable with, right? And Jesus says there's something greater than the temple where? Here. Is it safe to say that Jesus had the law written on his heart? Am I, am I, am I okay with that? Right. And he's up against people who only have the law written where? On paper. It says that he desired mercy rather than sacrifice. Mercy rather than sacrifice. That's right. right. Now it goes back to my original question. What does the law written on the heart have that the law written on stone does not? It has no mercy. Does the stone care if the disciples are hungry? No. 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 Not at all. Did the law 
that was given back in Exodus about how to build the temple and everything else, did it care whether or not David was hungry? No. Herein lies the problem with the law. Herein lies the problem with it being transmitted on paper and stone, which is something he never had in mind. He wanted it to write on the heart. Now, the thing, too, about it is, I'm going to see where I'm at here. Seven. But if you desire what this means, he's quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. Now, Hosea is a pre-exilic prophet. He's one of the last voices that Israel will hear before they go into exile. Okay? Israel thinks that they've got everything, that they're okay, that they're fine. For 700 years, the, the captivity has been predicted to them. For 700 years, it's been prophesied, and they're still not listening. And the reason they're not listening is that they're doing all the forms of worship that Pastor Gary has been taking us through. They're, they're sacrificing their children. They're going to the fertility gods. They're doing all those things, but yet they're still doing the sacrifices as prescribed where? In the shadow. They're still doing those. And they're still living on the land that Joshua gave their great, 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 great grandfather. So every time a prophet shows up and says, you've got to get off this road, you can't be doing this anymore. There is no way there. The way you're going, there is no way. There is no life there. The bridge is out. Their argument back to the prophet is, how can I be condemned of God? I still have the land that he gave to give to Joshua, to give to my family, and we still have the temple. There's the argument. So when Hosea says to the people, if you'd have learned what this meant, I desire mercy, compassion, and not sacrifice. That's the context. See, because while they're worshiping him and worshiping all the other gods, they've forgotten about everybody else. There are widows and poor people living throughout Israel. And these good, holy people, even though the, the ones that only have the, 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 the letter written on, on, on paper, they're, they're grinding their faces. Isaiah says literally, you grind the faces of the poor into the dirt as you're walking up to the temple to offer your sacrifice. Does the law provide for a widow if she doesn't have a male heir? No. Her father has to be willing to take her back, or the brother has to be willing to do it. But if the brother refuses, well, first of all, he's breaking the law. But the letter on paper doesn't provide. There's no mercy there. There's no sacrifice. The law written on the heart, a living, breathing relationship with God. He could come back to me, and he can say, I know what the letter says. And by the way, that's what he'll say tomorrow to us when we finally come up the mountain. You've heard it said, thou shalt not kill, but I say to you, Jesus is speaking from the tablet or he's speaking from where? He's speaking from the heart. He said, if you and I were to, were to be walking together, I could explain this to you, but you insist, Greg, on addressing me. You insist on coming at me with this. How many here have been to Angwin? No PUC. Do you know the area? How many been up there? Sabbath fell on July 4th. Or actually, let's put it this way. July 4th fell on Sabbath one year. And we had lunch at lunchtime. Okay? At lunchtime. We had it at noon. Right? What time do you think sundown is on the West Coast? About 9.30, probably. Feels like midnight. All right? especially on the 4th of July when you're waiting to go to Napa to see a fireworks show. Okay? Dad decides that we're going to leave early. We'll just go for a drive. I think we drove over, to, uh, drove over to, uh, to Goat Rock. Everybody loves going to Goat Rock. It's, it's about a 45-minute drive from Angwin to the coast. Okay, and Goat Rock's over on the coast. So drove, we ate lunch, we drove, we, we got over there. By the time we get back to Napa, it's only about 6.30. I didn't want to go back up the hill. I mean, today it's ridiculous. Today I look back and it's ridiculous saying, you know, Napa is 28 minutes from Anglin. Holy cow. 
but I didn't want to go back up the hill. Okay. But at 6.30, we ate at noon, and I have a two-year-old. Guess what? He's hungry. Actually, his dad is more hungry than he is. But dad is trying to live in the tablet. And dad has his hands on the steering wheel, and he's determined he's going to live this out. My poor son is hungry. I made him wait. For no other reason than to live in the shadow and to feel good about myself. Our last camp meeting here before we went to England and this was what funny is that I did that to my own son after what happened to me, us, at our last camp meeting here before we moved to England. Our daughter had a friend come with us. We brought the friend to camp meeting. And uh, she's never had any experience being around Adventists before at all. And so you take, you take this, this girl who's in eighth grade and you thrust her into this environment. Okay? And you feed her food that she's never, ever, ever considered putting in her mouth. And by the third day, she can't eat anymore. By the third day, she's, oh, she, she's sick. She, you know. And she comes to us on Sabbath, after, you know, to feed her Sabbath lunch. And, and, of course, it's the stuff that she can't eat. And uh, she just says, I can't, I, I can't eat. And I panicked. I looked at my wife and I said, well, what do we do? It's noon on Sabbath. And I'll never forget, Nellie looked at me. She goes, well, who do you think you are? Get in the car and take this girl to Burger King now. And she was absolutely right. But here it was a year later. And I do this to my own son. The problem with the letter of the law is that it has no what? It's got no blood. It's got no life. It's got no what? It's got no mercy. It's got no compassion. It doesn't take into consideration that Jesus himself would be hungry one day. All it says is don't work. Don't make someone else work. And I got starving children who are not going to understand that. Now you could be saying right now, you, you may think I did absolutely positively wrong that it was the wrong thing to do. I don't think so. I believe I was living what Jesus wanted me to live, knowing the letter of the law. The only thing I feel bad about was that she put up with it for five days and didn't say anything to us. As far as I know, she's never, <laughs> she's never had a meal in another Adventist home. <laughs> One thing to note here, too, is that I think as Sabbath keepers, we've looked at this story, and, and you all understand it. I hear your answers. You all understand exactly what Jesus is saying. You get it, right? You get exactly what he's saying. But I think sometimes as Sabbath keepers, we look at it in the wrong light. We, we actually say to ourselves, okay, it's okay to break the Sabbath as long as we're merciful. It's okay to break the Sabbath as long as we're doing something of mercy. You could think right now, and, and for years, that's what I thought I did for that little girl that day here in Prescott, that I broke the Sabbath, but it was okay because I was being merciful to her. And I missed something there. It's clear from these references and what Jesus is bringing up to the Pharisees is that God is seeking from them chesed, mercy, loving kindness. It's a beautiful word. I don't have time to go into it. But whenever God wants to get across steadfast love in the Hebrew scriptures, he uses the word chesed, love that won't go away. Love that will not go away. So it's simple to say that this is what the law is missing. Okay, hang on just a second. I need to finish this thought. And what I used to think was, was that it was okay to break the law as long as it was for an act of mercy. And what Jesus is saying is, no. If you're exhibiting mercy, you're not breaking the law. You're what? You're keeping it. You're fulfilling it. 
If you'd have known what this means, he tells the Pharisees, that I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. They're not breaking the law. They're fulfilling the law. Love does not break the law. Love fulfills the law. If I, re if, if I refuse to live in the new covenant, if you will, if I refuse to, 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 uh, to continue to operate in the shadows, as close as I can ever come to what Jesus was saying that day is, I, I broke the law, but I did it for a good reason. And Jesus is saying, no. If you really did it for that reason, then you're guiltless. Is that what you were getting at? No, I, I, was just, I was just thinking of the frequent murder of cases in this area. And uh, many times we tend to have a guilt and condemnation when God is not a bad God. Mm -hmm. And so advanced circumstances, if each one of us are not led by the Holy Spirit, none of them that goes up and draw because you made no. uh, uh, because mm -hmm. we made a misjudgment. Right. And sometimes we put ourselves under such guilt and condemnation and legalism. Mm -hmm. Right, but also on top of that, why would I be afraid? Why would any of us be afraid that that girl would be lost when God has already told us? That's right. He's already said, I'm not going to condemn someone else for your sin, okay? But see, we don't believe that about God because right. we're still trying to relate to him in the word. Right. Right. It's one thing to read that on paper, and it's another thing, you haven't been with us, but, but one thing that, that, that I've said that the fall has done to us is that the one, number one thing that it did to us is that it took away our ability to love. We don't love by nature anymore. But even worse, it took away our ability to be loved. Right, right. And we get a God complex. I'm a God complex person. Right. Everything to everybody and save the world. That's a lot of Yep. And it's the wrong person to be carrying it. Yes. We don't want her doing that. Do we? You don't want me doing it. There'd be quite a few of you not sitting here if it were up to me. My selfishness would have, you know, probably would have wiped a lot of people out before now. Now, let me give you, let me get this across to you. There is nowhere, anywhere, anytime, anybody is ever given permission to violate the law. There's no writings in the Talmud. There isn't anywhere. There's no rabbi in the Talmud that ever said, it's okay. It's okay to break the law. Because even the writers of the Talmud knew what Jesus was saying that day. The writers of the Talmud were the ones to say it first, as a matter of fact. Remember I was reading, you from, reading to you from Abraham Heschel? Well, in his book, The Prophets, commenting on that very verse that Jesus quotes, Heschel says this. He says, Hosea certainly can be considered in harmony with many other pre-exilic prophets who uttered violent attacks on sacrifices. If you, if you want to write down the list, Amos 5, 21 to 27, Isaiah 1, 11 to 17, Micah 6, 6 to 8, Jeremiah 6, 20, and 7, 21 to 23, Isaiah 60. You get the idea, right? Of all the prophets that ever uttered violence, if you will, uh, attacks on sacrifices and sacrificial system. He says, these prophets not only stress the primacy of morality over sacrifice. Did you get that? Morality over sacrifice, but even proclaim that the worth of worship, far from being absolute, is contingent upon moral living. And when immorality prevails, worship is detestable. Questioning man's right to worship through offerings and songs, they maintain that the primary way of serving God is through love, justice, and righteousness. There's a 20th century rabbi writing this. They got it. Sometimes, sometimes I think that, that we as Christians, we feel so arrogant that we need to light the way for the Jews when actually they've had it for a long time. And a lot of them got it. Hosea was not condemning the practice of sacrifice itself, nor were any of these prophets. If we're to believe that, then we'd have to conclude that Isaiah intended to discourage the practice of prayer in Isaiah 1, 14 and 15. They did, however, claim that deeds of injustice vitiate both sacrifice and prayer. Men may not drown the cries of the oppressed with the noise of hymns, nor buy off the Lord with increased offerings. The prophets disparaged the sacrifice when it became a substitute for righteousness. 
And that's what we've done with the letter of the law. It's our substitute for righteousness. Can you say that Jesus was one of those prophets who also disparaged the shadow because it became a substitute for righteousness? When he came across it, he did something about it, didn't he? I heard Don Pate tell it this way. One story this uh, one year was he, uh, he was telling a story. If you ever heard, uh, read Don Pate's book or uh, went through a sermon series with him, he, he dramatizes these, these stories and he takes you through the, uh, the way he puts it. I don't like the way he puts it, but takes you through the Old Testament get baggage that Jesus is working through. Okay? And one is uh, the money changers, what Jesus did when he encounters the money changers. You know, turns over the, the tables and everything else. He says, let me, tell you, let, let me show you what he's angry at. Let me tell you what he's angry at. You picture a farmer come all the way from the Golan, as far as you can come from the land of Israel, all the way from the Golan on Passover, carrying this little lamb. Lamb's just sitting there, got a dumb look on its face. Lamb doesn't know what's going to happen, right? Walks up, walks up to the priest, says, I'm here. The priest says, oh, Farmer Joe, so good to see you. Is this your sacrifice? Yes, I'm here to have it sacrificed. Have you had it inspected first? Because you know, it needs to be kosher. The law is clear on that. So he says, sure. Hands him the lamb. The priest starts feeling along, you know, feeling along. He's feeling along. And all of a sudden he goes, "Uh uh-oh. Uh-oh. Farmer, come here. Feel this little bump right here. Right here. Right on his abdomen. Feel this little bump. That's a defect. And the farmer goes, Okay. Has to believe him, because the farmer doesn't walk around feeling his lambs, you know, all, all day, doesn't know what they feel like. The bump is actually the lamb's spleen. The farmer doesn't know that, though. He says, well, I don't, I don't know what to do now. It's, it, it's the only lamb I got. I looked, him over, I looked over my whole flock, and I brought God my best. This is the best that I got. And I can't go all the way back to the Golan and get another one. I'll, I'll miss Passover. It's over in a couple of days. And he says, don't worry, don't worry. We can take care of you. We have fit lambs. We have kosher lambs. Already been inspected. They're in that pen right over there. And he says, well, what do I, what do, I do with this one? He goes, well, yeah, I'll take it off your hands for you. Five shekels. I'll give you five shekels for it. He says, okay. So he gives him the lamb. Takes five shekels. Walks over to the pen. Walks over to the pen. Has the five shekels, says, I need to buy a lamb. I had one, but it's not, not any good anymore. I got one, I, you know, and they told me that it's not any good, so I'm here to buy one. And he said, oh, okay, six shekels. Well, all I got is five. That's all he gave me. He goes, well, that one was no good. It takes six to get a good one here. Okay. So he reaches in his pocket, pulls out one more shekel, and puts it with the others, and he goes to hand it to him, and he goes, whoa, wait a minute. Can you tell me the Roman soldier hadn't touched the coin that you just put in your hand? No. That's all I got. I, well, don't worry. Don't worry. We can take care of you. That table right over there can exchange your ugly Gentile coin for temple coin. Just go right over there. So he walks over to the t- table with his six shekels. And he says, I'm here to exchange my coin. I, I've told that it might not be good. He says, no problem, sir. Excellent. How much, how much do you need? I need six shekels. Oh, they? Okay, that'll be seven shekels. But I'm only, I only need six. Well, it takes seven to get six here. A den of what? A den of thieves. In the context of the story, what he's telling is, is that the porch that's by the, where all this is taking place, the portico, that all this is taking place where the poor and the indigent and the invalid are all at is Solomon's portico, and it's right by the sheep gate. So for 38 years, that man that's laid there paralyzed on the net, this is what he's witnessed. And those same people are telling him that he doesn't belong in the temple because he's as deformed as those bad sheep. And this is the one Jesus comes to and says, do you want to get well? 
It's amazing that Jesus, when he would enter the temple, that's where he would enter from. Not the pilgrim's gate, but the sheep gate. Because the, the porch by the sheep gate, nobody ever wanted to go there because when the wind blew, I, uh, from doing this, let me ask you, now that I told you the story about the money changers, <laughs> what made Jesus angry? What was it that angered Jesus the most? Eating cheese? Okay. How do you know he was angry? He flipped the tables over. Is that the one time that he was angry? He flipped the tables over and all of that. And, and I, would say, I would say, yeah, he, he appeared angry that day, but you know what? None of the gospel writers who report that say that he was. There's only one time in the entire gospels, all four gospels, where it ever says that Jesus was angry. Ever. Where it's said. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. When he flipped the, <laughs> you take an entire table and flip it completely over. He seems pretty ticked, okay. But there's only one time where the gospel writer ever said that he was angry. It's, it's uh, this, this story right here. I think what I've done is I've put the conclusions up there, but not the whole story. So let me start. Mark chapter 3, verse 1. It says, again, he entered the synagogue, and a man who was there had a withered hand. You know the story, right? A man who was there had a withered hand. And they watched him to see whether he would cure him on the, uh, here we go again. What day is it? It's on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them this. Did I put that up there? Yes. He said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were what? They were silent. This man's had this condition for how long? Almost as long as his life. It's been so long that it appears to be chronic. It may even appear to them to be congenital. You know why it's so weird that he's in the synagogue today? Is because he never would have been allowed in before. When they adopted synagogue worship and coming back from the captivity, by the way, I believe the synagogue worship system saved Israel. Had, had they not instituted the synagogue system, uh, the, the, the diaspora would have just scattered Israel and it wouldn't even be around anymore. But the problem is, is that when they adopted the synagogue system, they adopted it all with temple rules. And who was allowed to go into the temple to worship? They gave, the, they gave the same purification rules to the worshipers that they did to the priests. And so he was never even allowed into the synagogue because of whatever happened to his hand. But today he's in there. Which is about as detestable as what we were talking about the other day, John about the Pharisees catching the woman in adultery. For 22 years, this guy has sat outside the synagogue, told that he doesn't belong because God is upset with you. There's something you have done. It's obvious. Look at your hand. You must be a sinner beyond what we can imagine. How can we let you in this church? Except today, when they want to condemn the rabbi who they know is coming, they bring him in. Have they done it out of compassion? They've done it for one reason, and that's to catch Jesus. It's the same, women, the same reason they brought him, brought him the woman to, in adultery. We want to catch him. What do they want to catch him doing? Violating what? Violating the law. That's what they want to catch him doing. Okay? So he says this. He gives them a, a, another midrash question, a, a rabbinic question. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? What is the answer to that question? I can tell you right now, I've spent as much time in the shadows as I've spent, and I know the answer to that question. But they were silent. Why were they silent? Whenever a Pharisee shuts up, you know you got him. When he shuts up, you know, well, first, actually, he calls names first, and then he shuts up. Remember when the, when the man born blind had exasperated all their arguments? What did they resort to after that? You're a sinner. You're a sinner. You've always been a sinner. You can't lecture me. 
I always used to say that if you come in on a fight and one has resorted to name calling already, which one's losing? And then here's what he says. He looked around with what? It's the only time, the only time in the entire Gospels that the writer ever said that Jesus was angry. He was grieved at the hardness of their heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. Stretched it out and it was what? Restored. And it was restored. Because that commandment that they were hoping that he would break, written in stone, Jesus has written where? He has it written on his heart. And I heard this line a while ago, and I'd like to make a t-shirt and a bumper sticker and a banner in my church. Is to say this. Jesus comes with the law written on his heart to a people who have it only on paper. And the people who have it on paper look at the one who has it written on his heart and they call him the devil. Always, a people, a person that has it written on paper will always look at the person who has it written on their heart and will call them the devil. In studying for this, I took, uh, I took the word law and all I did was type it into my search engine and hit send. And it came up quite a few times. Comes up about a hundred and some odd times. Anything over 100 in the New Testament, that's a pretty significant word. Okay, typed it in. And I uh, just began to read, just to read, again, just to have it on, on paper. And I thought, how dramatic does that look, just to have it you know, written on paper, just to read the law, read what the New Testament says about the law. Okay, and this is what I came up with. All right, so here's what it looks like on paper, just the words. What's it say? The law, what? Indeed was given through Moses... Grace and truth came through what? Came, right? And what else does Jesus have? Jesus has the law written where? So what's, what's, what's the conclusion that you can come to if we were to enter into this come up the mountain relationship is, is that grace and truth is what? Is the law. Grace and truth lived out is the fulfillment of the law written where? On the heart. Right? That's what the words say, right? It's not too bad when those words are written. Boom, there they are. Okay? But take a look at these. Crowd answered him and said, We have heard from what? We had heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? He's standing right in front of him. And by the way, by John chapter 12, he's given them every sign that they ever wanted. And yet they refuse, the same way that he said, they refuse to enter or to come to him for life. They're still wondering who this son of man is. Why? Because it says, we have heard from what? From the law. Law written where? On stone. John, here's our story. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What did Jesus do with the letter of the law that day? What do you say? Pilate said to them, take him for yourselves and judge him according to the law. By the way, he was breaking no Roman law. Absolutely breaking no Roman law. Pilate judged him fairly that day. Pilate looked for every opportunity to release him. Every opportunity. I can't get into why they were pushing and pushing that they had to have Pilate do this. It's, it's because they wanted him crucified. They didn't just want him executed. They wanted him crucified. If they just wanted him executed, they could have done it themselves. They want Pilate to do it because Rome is the only one that can crucify. In fact, if, if somebody were to crucify instead of Rome, Rome would crucify them and everyone in their village. Only Rome can crucify. And why do they want Rome to crucify him? Because everybody that is hung on a tree is cursed. And they wanted the argument from now on. How can he be cursed by God and blessed by God at the same time? He can't be the anointed one. He can't be the Messiah. And why did Jesus allow himself to be crucified? Because that's what he wanted. 
He became our curse. Anyway, the Jews replied, we're not permitted to put anyone to death. It's a lie, first of all. The law says they can put to death. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. They lived those out. It's interesting, by Jesus' day, it's nearly impossible. The rabbis made it nearly impossible to put somebody to death. But they could. And then it says this, we have a what? We have a law. And according to that law, he must die. The amazing thing here is that the God that authored the law was condemned by it. Or rather, it was condemned by a people who worship, of it, worship it on paper and stone and refuse to come to him for life. We'll talk a bit about it tomorrow. I don't want you to come to the conclusion that I'm telling you that Bible study is worthless, that we shouldn't be studying the law on paper anymore. That's not what I'm saying. What we'll talk about tomorrow is what does study look like when you enter it through covenant eyes? What does study look like when we come to him and, and, and actually engage in what he wanted, and that was to write it on the what? To write it on the heart. What does that look like? But if I continue to live in this shadow, you know what makes this shadow so dangerous? Is that you can't tell me I'm wrong. If I come to a conclusion that is clearly written in the law, clearly, and you come to me and say, man, that's not lawful. You can't do that. What's my argument? It's right there. Gary put it real well last night. Legalism is paganism. And studying the law in order to be right and nothing else, it's paganism. It's sanctified paganism. It looks good on the outside. It looks real good because it allows me to teach. It allows me to preach. I know my stuff. It allows me to teach Sabbath school. It allows me to do all those things. It looks pretty good. But it's still what? And I'm here to tell you, I know that it's probably not our only problem, but it's probably our main problem because that's what Laodicea is. I am rich and have need of nothing. I've got my scriptures. I've got them knocked. I've got them memorized. I have, I have my last day prophet who, who wrote down things and got me to this point. I don't need anything. By the way, it's the church's last stage of degradation. It can't get any worse than that. Jesus has nothing good to say about Laodicea. Nothing good. And he says, if you don't, it's, it's, it's his final call, if you will. If you, don't, if you don't come out of the shadows, come away from your richness, get out of the letter and the sanctuary, come out of the shadows. He says, I got no choice. I'll have to vomit you out of my mouth. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. I'd rather you be a pagan. But Gary was telling us last night, we really are. <laughs> if that's the way we're relating to him, we already are. But he said, I'd rather you be a pagan. Because somebody ice cold is going to eventually figure out they need a blanket. And he goes, and I got blankets. They're pure white. He says, I got blankets, they're pure white. I got gold refined in the fire. So it's not a call to quit studying your Bibles. It's just an awareness that when we come to the letter on paper of its limitations, it can only condemn because it's got no mercy, it's got no blood, it's got no life in it. Christ has to put the life in it. So we look at it through covenant eyes from now on, right? Look at your Bible. It is the light. But Jesus didn't say, my scriptures are the light of the world. He said, I am the light of the world. Great. Tomorrow, 
we get to head up the mountain. Moses got to go up Horeb, accepted the face-to-face -face relationship. He invited Israel up Sinai. They refused the relationship. Jesus is going to walk up a mountain tomorrow and invite us all up. That's why it's a tale of three mountains. And he's inviting us all to come out of the shadows. Thanks for being with me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for bringing us together today. Um, Lord, I, I'm, I'm the very first one. I'm the very first one to confess in front of my brothers and sisters here and to you that I spend way too much time living in the shadows. I don't allow you to reach me. I don't allow you to touch me because I think I've got it all figured out. I need brothers and sisters. I need uh, church. I need my, my, my friends to, 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 to keep me and to keep, continue to call me out of the shadows. And I ask, I ask that we have all those people in our life and that the, that the church become that light, that we encourage each other to, to, to grow and, and to open up our minds. Help us to constantly be seeking you. Help us to constantly be coming up the mountain. Keep everybody safe. Bring us back together again tomorrow. We ask this in Jesus' name.